on that note, uh, welcome to Banned from Encryption uh, with Mustafa al Bassam and Jake Davis. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mustafa, and this is Jake. Hello. And uh, we were banned from um, encrypting stuff for about two years, or well, actually five years. And uh, this is something called a serious crime prevention order that we were bound to for five years, from 2013 from 2018, which recently expired a few months ago. And the reason why we were bound to this um, serious crime prevention order is because we co-founded this hacking group called LulzSec that hacked into a whole bunch of stuff, including Sony Fox, FBI affiliates, US Senate, too long, too long for list to mention. Um, so for example, one of the things we did is we put up a fake news article <laughs> on the PBS website saying that Tupac Shakur was still alive in New Zealand. A lot of people still believe this is true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we also put, uh, this was back during the News of the World hacking scandal. <laughs> During the News of the World hacking scandal, we hacked into the Sun newspaper to put up a fake news article that Rupert Murdoch said Rupert Murdoch ingested a large quantity of palladium before stumbling into his famous topiary garden and passing out early in the hours of the morning. The Sun didn't like that. And um, for some reason, a lot of people found this funny. Like this was, we didn't. We, people found watching crime on Twitter funny. Like as Jake says, like people watching. The, the release of a new movie followed by following this hashtag on Twitter. Um, so as a result of all of this, we were arrested in the summer of 2011. And um, as a condition of our bail, we were banned from using the internet. And we were, bail, we were on bail for about two years. And Jake, additionally, was also on electronic tag, which means he had to report to a police station. Oh, yeah, that means... Yes, yeah. I had a, on top of an internet ban, an electronic ankle tag from G4S, awful bastards. Um, and then Serco, even more awful bastards, uh, essentially enforced that I was in my home between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. every single day. Otherwise, it would start beeping and people would come around in a van. And essentially worked with just a tag and a box. And if the tag was not near the box, uh, it went off. Uh, allegedly, Wireshark shenanigans could occur between the tag and the box. Yeah. That might be another talk. <laughs> <laughs> So the exact, the exact thing that I said on, our, on my bail conditions was that um, I was not allowed to use any device that had, a cap that had the capacity of connecting to the internet. And this was, this was when I was doing, when I, this was when I was just starting my A-levels when I was 16. And it was really difficult to kind of do my A-levels without accessing the internet. Because, like, for, for example, like, all of my homework was sent over email. So like, I got a lot of detentions because I didn't do my homework. Because I couldn't <laughs> access my homework. And um, like a lot of these A-level courses that actually have, for example, in the biology coursework, it says you get extra points for using internet references. So like, I was actually missing out on, on points in my grade because I couldn't use the internet. And um, during, during the time we were banned from the internet, uh, I think it was the European Courts of Human Rights or something that uh, released uh, a piece saying that it's actually against your human rights, against someone's human rights, to ban them from accessing the internet. And since they released that, they stopped putting these kinds of bail conditions on people. And uh, yeah, we were sentenced in 2013, so about two years after we were arrested uh, in Saudi Crown Court. And, uh, and we were also given a, a serious crime prevention order that lasted until 2018. I, cause, because I was under 18 when I was arrested, I had um, 320 hours of community service in a, in a charity shop. And uh, I think you had a two-year suspended, uh, you had a two-year sentence, but you only spent a month of that. Two-year sentence, yeah. and luckily that magic electronic tag knocked off most of that. But you had the charity shop work where you sold some ice cream. <laughs> no, I, I got free ice cream from, like, pe from the people who were working there, but it was a, yeah, it was a charity shop that sell, sold clothes for deaf blind people, which is, which, is, which is nice to be volunteering in, I guess. So, so this was this is one of the first. This is the first clause of my serious crime prevention order. It says that I may possess, use, or control one or more laptops, personal computers, or physical devices capable of accessing the internet, provided that that for each such item, 
where, where an item has the capacity to retain and display the history of internet use, such capacity is and remains enabled. So that means I can't delete my browsing history, and I can't use private browsing either. And the second one is um, such item does not run software which is designed to prevent data from being retrieved from the unallocated space on the storage drive. So that means every time I delete a file, usually when you delete a file, it doesn't actually delete the contents of that file, it just deletes like an like a, like a index to that file. So this is preventing me from actually deleting files properly by, over, by overwriting them with zeros. And uh, the third one was it is not encrypted other than factory installed encryption or encryption used in the course of employment or education purposes as notified. And any encryption password or key must be provided to the Metropolitan Police Life Offenders Management Unit on request. And I can't use hidden volumes either. Now, um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite vague what this means. Like, what does it mean for, for, for a device to be encrypted? Like, does that mean that the communications can't be encrypted? Or does that mean the storage itself on the device can't be encrypted? Like, personally, I interpret that as the storage itself can't be encrypted. But I did it anyway because there's an exception for employment or educational purposes. Um, and so you have, to, you have to keep in mind that originally when they tried to draft this serious crime prevention order, the lawyers tried to put in a clause in the order saying that every time we use the cloud, we had to email them. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, and then my, I'm like, Do you even, what is the cloud? Do you even know what that means? And then they had to, they, they removed it when we challenged them, challenged them on it. We wouldn't be able to email them without that same cloud. Yeah, so yeah. in their minds, there were different clouds. Yeah, it would be like a recursive loop that yeah. ends forever. Like every time I email them, I'm using the cloud, so I have to email them again. And they didn't appreciate when we explained that to them. They didn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll get on to more of those in a bit. Yeah. Five long years of them. And yeah, and the fourth one is no virtual computers are installed or controlled from the device, say for the purposes of employment or education. And that's because when they arrested Jake, they found like 15 virtual, com virtual computers on his, on his device. And, I thought, and the judge found that a bit scary. Yeah, the, judge thought that, the judge thought that there are 16 computers in one computer. This is not right. <laughs> this is, this, no, we need to stop. Confiscate yeah. this. So I guess the idea of this this one was to prevent us from like trying to hide our crimes or whatever. And this is quite, this is quite annoying because like, I, this means I can't buy a virtual private server to, like, to, to host a website or to host a server. So I had to buy dedicated servers instead. Which is like, it kind of defeats the purpose of the order. But uh, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so I bought dedicated servers in France and I notified them that it was in France. And they, didn't, they didn't seem to mind. And, um, also said that every time I come to own or possess any additional laptop, personal computer, or internet capable physical device, I must notify them within seven days, and I have to give them the name and the serial number of each laptop, and, and the location that it's usually kept. I, I don't really know what, what they mean by the name of, of the laptop, but I don't, I don't give my computers names. Maybe they mean the network name, but I don't know. Like, and uh, there's also, it also says that nothing in this order is supposed to prevent my lawful everyday use, like, like, like train, aircraft, or cinema ticket machines, travel check-in machines, supermarket automated machines, bank machines, point of sale, credit card payment facilities. And I think this kind of like just proves the point that, that, you, that when you're putting these conditions on someone, you have to realize that we live in a society now where everything we do is, is internet connected or mm -hmm. internet enabled or computer enabled. And so like, I had to send them these emails like every time I buy a new computer or destroy a computer or get rid of it. And uh, I had to uh, put a read receipt on them. So like, every time they opened them, I, I would get a read receipt. So I would get all these read receipts from all the times they opened my emails. But then like two years later, turns out they checked their records and they had nothing on file about anything I sent. They didn't, they didn't seem very competent to me because uh, like, Every year, like they have the, the, the person in charge of our case, like a new person, is, a new person is assigned. Because I don't think this is like the kind of job that any police officer wants. Like this is probably kind of like this is probably like the job that they get to be punished or something. Yeah. Like to, to deal with all <laughs> Check these. Check the orders. emails from these trolls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I'll talk about. I got the mic. Talk. About. So here are some. 
various discrepancies in the arbitrary banning over a five-year period. And I had to ask about these individually. Windows 10 is allowed, despite having inbuilt shredding functions to, again, remove files from an allocated space. Ubuntu, Mac, Mac, you just type shred. There it goes. Cubes is banned. I think cubes was the thing they banned the most. Well, I think they used, they used capital letters, no, for cubes. Kali, definitely banned. They saw the dragon. <laughs> Amazon EC2s, I don't think they understood the description of those and saw the word cloud, server, and banned those. VPNs are fine if I tell them which VPN, and it's based in the UK, hence your dedicated server in France. Yeah, I use uh, a VPN in my dedicated server located in France. Yeah, and it, which is Tor, definitely banned. They don't like Tor. Chrome incognito is allowed because my clause said that I wasn't allowed to delete internet history, but it didn't say I had to generate internet history. <laughs> They, they, I think they appreciated that one, actually. Um, and so one time I just emailed them, maybe two years ago, saying, what is encryption? Because HTTPS, etc. cetera, or when we withdraw from a bank now, sometimes it's encrypted. Um, and this is exactly what they said. They said, BlackBerry with PGP. That's all they said. They said, you can't use that. I went, well, OK, fine. I won't use a so, BlackBerry with PGP. <laughs> so I mean, like, you have to realize that the people replying to this have no technical or computer background. Like, they're just saying what they think. So like, like, I think like a lot, they're actually quite, I actually think they're wrong about most of these if you actually look at the legal document. Like in theory, Tor is, should be allowed because it's not, if I'm using Tor, I'm not encrypting my laptop, I'm just encrypting my, my communications. In theory, Cobagnito shouldn't be allowed because it says in the order that if the device has a capability to generate, to generate history, that has to be enabled. So I don't think these people really knew what they were talking about. No, and because it was a five year period, as Mustafa said earlier, um, the iterations, they had various iterations of the team. And so the new people that came in had to deal with the, the sort of scraps left by the others. And by the end of the five years, you're looking at police officers that didn't even know an SCPO existed, now having to pick up one of the most bizarre cases of them. Because there are not many of these SCPOs around. I just think they tried to find the most severe restriction they could and threw this at us. Yeah, so most of these SCPOs are usually like for people, they're not usually made for like computer hackers, they're usually made for like people who commit large scale fraud. So like for, and then they put conditions in there, like you have to tell us about all your bank accounts. Or like, for example, people are, um, accused of um, sexual crimes, so they didn't have to like, report this or whatever. So some more human stories from the people behind the acronym, SCPO, L-O-M-U. Uh, I had seven device disclosures in five years. So every time I bought a new phone, I had to send them. We sent the IMEI and SIM, etc. Except my tactic, as I'll talk about more, was to send way too much information. So I'd send like the color of the phone, where I bought it from, like if I liked it, if I liked the glass, <laughs> the glass screen. And uh, because there were seven new device disclosures, that wasn't just me sort of buying seven new phones, mostly because I smashed some of them. And I would then send them pictures of the smashed phone. And I said, I can't believe it happened again. It fell out of a locker, hit the floor. You know, these Samsung screens, not very good. They didn't, res they, so they started responding with a few jokes. Oh, did you have the Samsung phone that could blow up? I had the Samsung phone. I sent them the news article, and I said, I bought a new Samsung phone. Don't worry, this is the one that does not blow up. <laughs> so 13 international travel disclosures. As you can imagine, airports are very amusing. When we were arrested, and years later, we tried to get our passports back. They claimed they lost them. This was the case with us and many others. And so our passports did not work at the e-passport readers. We had to go to the manual check and they always got about nine boxes up on their screen, and their face just dropped. <laughs> and I don't know what they had to deal with, but I, it depends on the uh, seniority of the customs yeah. officer. Usually, usually they write something down on a piece of paper. Like every time we, so our e-passport chips were disabled um, in the UK. Like we could use our e-passports everywhere else except the UK. So when we go through the UK, we, have to, we, we always have to go through the manual border control. Like usually, and there's usually like a queue specifically for the people whose e-passport gates doesn't, doesn't work. And you can see this, it's full of criminals there. <laughs> like, um, and um, so every time we go through, they usually like have to write something down on a piece of paper. And then when we go through, they usually close their, their specific booth for like five minutes. Because they have to email the, uh, the um, Metropolitan Police every time we enter the UK. Mm. My favorite, um, well, I, I enjoyed going through in the end because I knew what they'd see. 
and I knew if they were an inexperienced customs officer, they would quite panic and like try and buy time and ask me questions. And I went through once, and this guy, this grizzled guy, he'd seen it all, and he just went, very impressive. Never seen, <laughs> never seen this many restrictions before. <laughs> very good. He was like very nice and handed me my passport back. So there's some sense of humor with it. Um, <laughs> But within the five-year period, we had 10 different police contacts, I think all of whom either moved to the department or moved from another or senior um, or junior moving up. Um, so they don't think they knew each other. And so it was, it was a strange autonomy. And we got a different answer if we emailed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, et cetera. Uh, I, I can tell you a few things I gleaned from them. I've changed their names. The boss, Dave, likes Guinness. When I did a, a trip to Ireland, I disclosed, again, too much information. I, I was going on a camping trip, and I drew a physical map of all the campsites, and I faxed that through. <laughs> I, said, I said to, and the, the guy, though, he, to be fair to him, he said, oh, I hope you have a nice pint of Guinness. So that was nice. Uh, on the other hand, the time I went to Italy, one of the officers, Jason, does not like Italy. Very paranoid about my trip to Italy. I was just going to Venice and explore it. Venice is beautiful. He wanted my phone number again. I said, my phone number's on your records. He said, well, I need it again, which presumably means they lost mine too. Um, and they don't care for the anecdotes. They don't care for like the pictures I send them of the beach or <laughs> the, like the hotel room. I send them so many hotel rooms. And I said, well, this one is like for, for talks and such. And, and I said, well, this, this one is one is not, has a safe. What do you guys think of the safe? Would you, do you use this one? Um, and so I started to see this trend because I, well, it was sort of a self-defense mechanism. We didn't want to be, you know, we, we could, if we broke this order, we were going to prison for five years. So we didn't want to let them have this over us completely. So it became a bit of a psychological warfare just to mess with it. Mess so, so my strategy was actually opposite of yours. So like your strategy was to joke around with them, give, the, give them as much information as possible. No, but my strategy was the complete opposite. Like I, I, I was trying to make their job as hard as possible and give them as little information as possible. So like, for example, when they sent me that email saying, we have nothing on record, can you please send this everything again? I'm saying, I told them, that's not my problem, that's your problem. And yes. the thing is, like, that guy, the, the guy uh, was a, a bit scared because he has nothing to show to his boss he, that for, uh, for any records that he has for me, even though I've sent them. So I think in some way they were kind of more scared of me than I was scared of them. Mm. And, um, and I didn't want to give them extra information because I, don't, cause I, wanted, I, didn't, want, I didn't think that's, that it would be right for them. It would be right to do that. Indeed. Yeah. We've got a few minutes left, so there's a, we can talk a little bit more about... This is what I realized, compliance through rambling and the psychological warfare of hypothetical trolling. Um, and just that they, they started to ask after a few years for less information. So they left us alone. For example, because we had to uh, disclose every new phone um, that we bought uh, in vast detail, well, it was very a quick process for us. But for them, they probably had to sit there and type it in various columns and all of this. So hypothetically, we could just run a script to scrape eBay for job lots of very cheap phones and then disclose to them all of the IMEIs, hundreds of them, and they'd have to sit there all day for weeks just inputting them over and over again. And we didn't tell them we could do that, but I think they knew that we were the type of people that would do that if, you know, if for example, they decided to come and like, arbitrarily check our computers. So we didn't have any computer checks for five years, even though they did have the power so to actually, do that. So actually, I did have one. You're not trolling them enough. No, because when I, when I told them, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to um, tell you any, I'm not going to send you my emails again. They, made, they said that I should, they made me bring all my devices to a police station. But, but then, so then, so they made me bring all my devices to a police station so they could, so they could see them and check them. And then, and then the guy told me to open my laptop. And I said, okay. And then I said, okay, what next? And he said, he didn't, he didn't know what to say what next because he didn't, he didn't know what to check. <laughs> yeah. One of the 16 VMs. So one very quick example. Uh, this is one of the emails I sent them. Oh, it's disclosed the reply. Well, never mind. Um, this is about my Samsung phone. I said, oh, you won't believe it. The, the phone I disclosed in my last email, it also smashed. And this was in an email thread so they had for like four years. This time it fell out of a locker when I was grabbing my coat. One small crack in a Samsung screen is apparently enough to obliterate it. Anyway, I got another Samsung, the one that apparently overheats and sets itself on fire randomly. I hope that doesn't happen, otherwise I'll have to disclose another one. <laughs> I also got a pair of Gear VR goggles with the phone, which, don't worry, are designed to enter virtual reality, not create a virtual computer. <laughs> same SIM, same number, same color, charcoal black again. About three days went by, and they responded, no hello, no regards, just 
Thanks, Jake. <laughs> so, <laughs> five years of these shenanigans, and um, they were, I think they were delighted to get rid of us, actually. <laughs> so I think we can conclude that the orders make no sense. I think that's the conclusion. I don't for, think, at least for computer hackers, at least. It doesn't, it doesn't seem that it's the fault, potentially, of the team behind it. I don't think they liked having to enforce these orders either. The orders were made through a strange combination of the Crown Prosecution Service, the judge, um, the police, all coming together to try and define this, this new thing. In the same way we were banned from the internet, and that doesn't really happen anymore, they were sort of testing all of these things on us because our case at the time was one of the first of that nature in, in terms of the public domain. So all of these things were sort of just thrown as a test, and they realized they don't work, and they won't use them again. Um, but I think they are now realizing, even over the five-year period, as we know, uh, the state of encryption has changed so much. Um, and so year on year, as weeks went by, um, and months, uh, it was very evident that they can't just say, no HTTPS, yes, you can use Windows 10, but no Ubuntu, and no Kali, and no Amazon EC2s, but you can use a VPN if it's in the UK, and you can't use a VPS, but you can use a dedicated server in France with a non-UK VPN inside of it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yes, most of anything to add on SCPOs make no sense? Yeah, I don't think they really make much sense for computer <laughs> hackers. Like, I don't think they were designed with computer hackers in mind. I think, as I said, they were designed for um, financial criminals and that sort of, like, you have to declare all your, all your bank accounts and stuff like that. And I think the idea isn't necessarily, I think the idea was supposed to, is, is to frustrate crime. Like, on a, uh, on a subconscious level, like, you're thinking, like, what, you, you, if, if you have a serious crime prevention order, you, you'll probably think twice about committing crimes because you know that the, the police could ask you at any second to uh, let them examine their la your laptop. Like if they had any evidence that you committed more crimes, they, they wouldn't have to get a warrant. They, would, they could just examine your laptop whenever they wanted. Yeah, Indeed. The final slide. That's the final, so I guess we could impart the advice, don't get an SCPO. <laughs> <laughs> that seems good. Yeah, that's good advice. That's a good one. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. That's the, that's the SCPO. <laughs>